Good evening. I'm your host. My name is Don Chamberlain, and I'd love to introduce you to the crew here. First off, we have Mr. Donald Culp from Columbus, Ohio. Say hi, Don. Hello, everybody. God bless you. And from there, we'll slide on down to Houston, Texas with the Lewises, Michael and Dan. How are you guys doing tonight? Hot and humid. We love it. Blast. <laughs> And then look to the fruits and nuts with Sandra out in California. I'm a nut. How you doing? <laughs> and then we'll come back to little downtown Brooklyn with its two street lights and a bar and a grill and a church. <laughs> Don, you want to open us up with a word of prayer? Okay. Well, Heavenly Father, we thank you for this wonderful time we have to gather together. And to hear Don teach the word on Ephesians chapter 4. We're excited to hear it, what he has to say. We are, we have our ears on and we're just like big sponges waiting to hear your word. We thank you for every person that's listening. Thank you for blessing them. And thank you for feeding them the word of God as they can take it. And I thank you for watching over every person who is studying your word that wants to hear it and has a hunger and a desire to hear it, that if they hear this, that they will be filled. Thank you for this wonderful evening. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Amen. Well, we've gone through the first three chapters of Ephesians, and it has set out the doctrine, the greatest doctrine in the Bible, I believe, uh, it just sets out what we have now as sons and daughters of God. We have the adoption, and we, God wants us, and not only wants us, but He, he, he is our physical father, or our spiritual father as well. Chapter 4 begins practical application. So let's just get right into it. And Ephesians 4 1 says, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech ye that you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith ye are called. Here we have the same word prisoner as was as was in the last chapter. I should mention that a prisoner is a fine translation for this word. I just wanted to point out that the word means bound. We're bound to something. We're bound to Jesus Christ. And that that's a binding that will go on forever. The word vocation is the Greek word kleis. I believe that's how it's pronounced, kleis. It means to have a calling. We're to walk worthy of our calling. What does that mean? This first means that we heard God's calling, like it talks about in 1 Timothy Two four, where it says that God would have all men to be saved. When we got saved, we were given certain abilities. And we were to use them for the benefit of the body of Christ. 1 Corinthians 12.12 12 and following, and Matthew 10.8, and uh, Corinthians 14.5 and following, this involves all nine operations of the manifestate of the spirit all nine manifestations we've got to be working with all nine of them going in our lives because you need it we're in a spiritual battle we cannot win it physically or carnally you have to employ that those spiritual weapons otherwise you're just going to get beat all the time Verse 2, with all lowliness and meekness, with long suffering, forbearing one another in love. The word lowliness means to keep our minds in check. Remember all that was expounded in chapters 1, 2, and 3 about how it's by grace and we had nothing to do with it, with our being saved. It's because of what Jesus Christ did. It's not because of what you or I did. It's because of what Jesus Christ did. And that's something you need to remember. Too often people start down this road where they think, oh, I'll go get myself saved. I'll, I'll do this and I'll do that. And 
you know, go here and I'll go there and I'll be at the right church and I'll join the choir and I'll become an usher and, you know, do all these great things. And you know what? That doesn't amount to hill of beans. When you come right down to it, if you have not confessed Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior and believe that God raised him from the dead, you're in a serious bind because you're being run by the world. And you will continue to be run by the world. What we need to do is just remember, have that lowliness of mind, and remember that Jesus Christ uh, is the reason that we are what we are, and it's by the grace of God. Okay, meekness. Meekness does not mean being a wimp. Jesus Christ was the meekest man who ever lived. He was no mealy mouth wimp. He confronted the heads of the temple and told them the truth about themselves. He called them hypocrites, white <coughs> sepulchers. He told them they were of their father, the devil. I mean, this is, this is some pretty heavy stuff he was throwing out there. Meekness just simply means you understand there's something bigger than you. Jesus Christ understood that there was something bigger than him because he was not God. God was bigger than he was. Continuing on, long-suffering means we have patience. You know, it, it's really funny. Sometimes you'll hear people ask for more patience because they think it sounds good. The only way to get more patience is to have tribulation. You cannot have more patience unless you are being tested and everything's coming at you and you have to sit there and understand that it's God who's at work and that he will get you through it. I mean, I'll, I'll never forget when I, I learned this because there were, everybody was quite suddenly, instantly suddenly stopped praying for patience because it meant that, you know, you were going to get hit with something if you kept praying for patience. So just remember that. Be careful what you pray for. You just might get it. I like the ESV version, ESV translation on this. With all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love. I love that translation because that's exactly what we're supposed to be doing. Verse 3, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. The word endeavoring means to put forth a great effort. It's the same word that's translated study in 2 Timothy 2.15, where it says, study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman who needeth not to be ashamed, greatly dividing the word of truth. That word endeavoring has the same meaning, putting forth a great effort putting forth everything you can to bring it about in your life. We put forth great effort to keep ourselves unified on the spirit. We also need to keep the bond of peace. The word used for unity is only used twice in the entire Bible. Here and in verse 13. Both times it's talking about unity of the spirit. The word bond is used is used of ligament, how ligaments are tied together. I've also heard it, some people say that it has the same meaning. If you got a big bundle of sticks and you put a rope around them and tied it together so that, you know, you could carry the sticks on your back, that's that same word, bond. Now, this is, this is totally awesome. <coughs> there is one body in one spirit, as ye are called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of us all, who is above all and through you all. Now, the word one is used seven times here. There are seven things listed. Number one, there is one body of Christ the living Savior, and he is the head of that body. No person is more important than any other person within that body. We all have our jobs to do, and we're all expected to fulfill them. 
Number two, there is one spirit. Number three, there is one hope. You don't have 16 different kinds of hope. There's only one kind. So when people start saying, I hope this happens or I hope that happens, they're not talking about the real hope. Our real hope is the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. Number four, there is one Lord Jesus Christ. Number five, there is one faith. Number six, there's one baptism. You may remember in Acts 1.5, it says, For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with Holy Spirit. Now that should actually read, you shall be baptized in, in Holy Spirit. No article D. There is one God and Father of us all, and in you all, and in you all. The number one is used seven times. The number seven is the number of spiritual perfection. The items listed, the seventh of the items listed, the seventh item is God. Jesus Christ sits in the middle at number four between man, who's number one, and God. He is the bridge, the mediator between God and man. I thought that was so neat that he would put Jesus Christ in the middle between us and God because that's exactly the truth. Verse 7, But unto everyone of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. We are told we are given grace. No place are our works ever even mentioned. The only mention of works in Ephesians is by grace you are saved, and it is gift not of works, lest any man should boast. And we were created unto, not by, but unto good works. And the good works that it's listed there cannot be accomplished without all nine manifestations being involved. Because those good works, it's not talking about just feeding the poor. It's talking about healing the sick, raising the dead, causing the blind to see, healing the lepers, healing the people who are dying from cancer, healing, anybody, healing the blind, healing the deaf, healing the mute. All of that stuff is available. And you know something? It's actually happening in the third world where they're not quite so sophisticated. Let me tell you something. Sometimes the fact that we know as much as we know, it, it, it's a blessing and it's a curse. It's a blessing in the fact that, you know, we do have this knowledge. We know that, you know, you can't, you don't get um, what, AIDS by just being in the same room with somebody who has AIDS. It's a non-communicable disease. You don't get, you don't get, you know, we know certain things like that, but then we get so, we think we're so sophisticated and we have to be complicated. The Word of God is rarely, if ever, complicated. I mean, how simple is, if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. How difficult is that? It's like falling off a log backwards. It happens all the time. And it's simple. And that's what I love about the Word of God. It is simple. 99 out of 100 times, it is just simple. Sometimes there are, yes, there are complicated issues in there sometimes, matters of translation and well, does it really mean what it says here? Uh, you know, is the word mystery, the word mystery, we were talking about that before we started. It should actually be translated secret, or sacred secret, would it, or divine secret would be better in uh, translations of that word. And, you know, it's, it's really great that we have all this knowledge, but sometimes I would give up all the knowledge I have for some simple believing. Just trusting God, or trusting God would be a better way to put it. I would give up a lot sometimes, just have that simple trust in God. Because when you get that simple trust in God, like a little kid, you tell them, 
God will heal you. And they believe it. And they get healed. I mean, I remember back in the day, one of the things that was always being said is, if you're sick, go get a kid to pray for you. Go get a kid to pray for you because you'll get healed. Because they don't doubt anything in their mind. They just, okay, you know, I'll pray for you and you'll get healed. And that's how it should be. Okay. Verse 8. Wherefore he said when he ascended up on high that he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. This is the uh, revised English version on that verse. And it is a good translation. It shows how close to accurate the King James really is. That's, this is King James I'm reading, by the way, if anyone's interested. Not because I think King James is the begin-all and end-all of everything, like many people do, but just because I happen to be more used to dealing with King James than any other version. Verse 9. Now, now that he ascended, what is it? But he also descended first into the lower parts of the earth. He that descended is the same also who that ascended up far above all of the heavens and earth and and that he might fulfill all things. Verse 9 and 10 are just basically pointing out who led, who it was who led captivity captive. Jesus Christ led it captive. Now, these are, so, these are the gifts that it was, he was talking about. He gave some apostles and prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers. There's a figure of speech involved in this verse. It's... Um, Polysyndeton, I believe, means many ands. And whenever you get all these ands, you know, it's telling you a truth that these things, there is no climax, that these things are probably equally important, that nothing's more important in that particular section than anything else. And these are the five gift ministries. It never says that the people who have these ministries are to be considered up there. The people who have these ministries basically have a job. They have a job to do. It's like Mike and I are both elders in, in the, T, the Living Truth Fellowship. That just It doesn't mean we're any better than anybody else. It just means that we've got a job to do. When they need something done, they turn, you know, quite often they'll turn to one of us and say, hey, can you blah, 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 you know, whatever it is, and, you know, you get to make the decision of yes or no. So in any case, don't ever think it's because somebody is a gift ministry that they are more to be lauded than anyone else. These are functions, basic functions. We all tend to function in these at times. If you've ever, for instance, told anybody about Jesus Christ, you have functioned as an evangelist. Now, verse 12 tells us why these ministries were given to us. For the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. The word edifying it's an old English word. It just means to build up. You know, like a, a great big building is called a great edifice. It's a big building. So these ministries are there for the building of the body of Christ. Two, we all come in the unity of faith and the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. This is the purpose we have these ministries. They will be here until it, we all are become the perfect man, till we become Christ-like. That will occur sometime after First Thessalonians chapter 4 occurs. I'm not sure whether it happens right then or a little later, because we've got a lot to go through. After church is gathered, there's a little bit more to happen, like the Battle of Armageddon and all fun stuff in the book of Revelation. So it may be a little bit later than 
just right after Jesus Christ comes back and grabs us out of here. Verse 14, that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro, carried with every wind of doctrine by the slight and cunning craftiness of man, whereby they lay in wait to deceive. Love that photo. <laughs> Yeah, I thought it was cute. But in contrast to being blown about like this poor lady here, speaking the truth in love, we may grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ, from whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplieth, according to the effectual working in every part, maketh increase of the body of itself, to, unto the edifying of itself in love. In verse 17, the word testify is the Greek word Marta Romia. It comes from the Greek word martyrs, or pr pronounced martus. It's where we get our word for the word martyrs. This word is only used three times in the entire Bible. Here, in Acts 20, 26, and Galatians 5, 3. So those are the three usages if you want to. I'll put up the uh, link for this teaching when I put up the uh, final product. We are no longer Gentiles. We are the church of the body. But these Christians were once and were surrounded by these Gentiles. Paul was reminding them not to fall back to what they once were. The word vanity is um, from one of Paul's made-up words, Paul or God's made-up words in Greek. Mike likes those Greek words that Paul made up. Um, in any case, it may, it's made up from two other words. It means what is devoid of truth and appropriateness, perverseness, and depravity. That kind of sets it for you there. Look back at the verse. We're not supposed to walk as other Gentiles, that we henceforth, that we walk not in the vanity of their mind, the perverseness of their mind. There you go. That's what the natural man has, a perverse mind. No matter what it, you might seem like, He's basically got a perverse mind. If we walk that way, our understanding will be darkened. And we will be alienated from the life of God that God has made available to us. It's all because of ignorance or moral blindness. It is only used twice in the whole Bible. Acts 3.17 and here. It is because of the blindness of their hearts. And that's one thing you don't want to do is fall back into that blindness. These Gentiles have given themselves over to darkness because they have refused to see the light. They've refused to see the light. That's something you always have to remember. That we, as well as them, back at that time, <laughs> we were walking according to the course of this world and somebody came along and made it available for us to get out of it we accepted it we said yeah sure God said who wants to be saved and we all went I do <laughs> and he plucked us out he plucked us out As, uh, that's an illustration John gave once we're not to walk in the vanity of our minds, in the perverseness, because our natu the natural man, the sin nature that we got from Adam is all about perverseness. Verse 20, but ye have not so learned Christ. If so be that you've heard of him and have been taught by him, as it is in truth, is in Jesus. There is a significant truth here most people never realize. In verse 21, it is that Jesus Christ is the one who teaches us. You may remember in Galatians 1, 
we get revelation from him as well. Paul stated that he wasn't taught this revelation. He got it from Jesus Christ. Now, I'm going to bring this to a halt here right now. And I want you to be sure to see part two. We'll be uh, back in a little while and do part two. So for right now, I'll say goodbye for the moment. And Don, why don't you close? Why don't you say goodbye? Bye. See you later. <laughs> and then we'll slide on down to Houston and the Lewises and say see you later. Later. See you on part two. And Chandra, over part to you. Two. Part two. And we'll be back shortly. So we'll see you later in part two of Ephesians 4.